Hi, um, my name's uh, Christelle Jones. I'm currently a captain in the Australian full-time army as a transport logistic officer. I'm currently uh, posted down to Albury Logistic Training Centre down in Albury, Wodonga, where I have a two-year posting. And I'm working for Workforce Training Group, uh, working on analyse and design of LMPs. I am a little bit different to, I guess, a few of my peers. I actually uh, enlisted or joined uh, Royal Military College in 2013 when I was 30 years old. I had a uh, experience of 10 to 12 years in retail, uh, working for Harvey Norman and managing. I also was lucky enough to uh, travel and live abroad in the UK, where I was a qualified sommelier for about three years. Why did I join military? Um, I got to 29 and thought I want to do something different. I want to give back to the community and I want to put some purpose back into things. My oldest brother, he's a uh, WO1, uh, currently the RSM at 3 Area, one of the regiments up in Townsville. And he advised or recommended that I have a look at DFR and try trial the one year um, trial. I took that and said, right, I'll challenge that and go on the 18 months and become a logistic officer. Since joining the military, I've had a few different postings. I've been lucky enough to uh, be posted up to 10FSB up in Townsville, where I did terminal operations. And I also uh, was lucky enough uh, to get posted uh, to the amphibious army boats up in Darwin. Uh, that gave me um, a desire to want to do more in the logistic world, but also in the tri service, working not only with RAF, but with Navy. Uh, in 2019, I was lucky enough to be allocated Headquarters Jock Liaison Officer to the Fijian military, where I did a strategic air logistic uh, planning uh, for our aircraft with the Fijians. Uh, so I lived over there for seven months uh, as an international engagement. So not only was I lucky enough to travel uh, to outside of the Australia, but I met some fantastic people and built some incredible relationships, which I to this day um, keep those close friendships. Uh, in 2021, I also was very lucky that I got another opportunity where I deployed as a peacekeeper, uh, UNMO, so UN Military Observer, uh, to our current uh, Australian operation, Op Paladin, which is the ADF contribute uh, to UNSO. Um, it was there I was deployed for eight months where I lived in uh, Lebanon and I was uh, posted to the out, um, outpost station of uh, Team Zulu. I worked with approximately 10 to 12 people over there from other countries, from Norway to Sweden to Denmark to China to Fiji, Irish. Um, and it was there where we um, patrolled. We used to jump in a vehicle into an up-armoured vehicle and would do a six hour patrol along the blue line. And that's where we were able to monitor, observe and report any violations uh, in vicinity of the blue line under the United Nations Security Council resolution. Um, it was a great opportunity because not only did you work for the UN, you got to represent the ADF, but you also got to work within a community of Lebanon. Lebanese people are fantastic, very similar to Fiji. They are friendly, they are humble, they'll give you their shirt off their back to you. Um, and it's there, once again, I made some really good uh, relationships, uh, but I also was very privileged and felt very lucky to be an Australian citizen, but also a member of the ADF. Coming back um, to Australia after being posted to um, a Middle East country, it's these things that you uh, take for granted that we are very um, free to do a lot of things, um, but uh, we enjoy the, um, the, the Western society. Um, so Lebanon um, is, it, so UNSO itself um, is actually five different countries. So Israel, uh, Lebanon, uh, Jordan, uh, Egypt, um, and what it is, it's all about, it's been established since 1948. So it's one of our longest serving peacekeeping operations, um, which Australia, we send about 15 people every year over as a rotating force. Um, currently in Lebanon, there's about 53 odd uh, United Nations members. And what they do there is that they assist with the, uh, the ceasefire agreement between Israel and Lebanon. So from that sort of Arab and Muslim war uh, back in the earlier years. 
Currently though in Lebanon and, and in the Middle East, you have a lot of um, society instability uh, with corrupt governments and a few other things that are going on. Uh, so gas um, prices, the lack of electricity, uh, the Russian and Ukraine war is affecting Lebanon because of prices of bread and things like that are going sky roof. Um, the uh, Beirut explosions had an effect because that took out a lot of infrastructure and it made like the cost of living go sky rise but the people that are working inside Lebanon the um, local wage is really low so to try and actually um, afford to live uh, over there is day-to-day uh, -day struggles uh, and then you've got obviously part of um, in the Middle East, you've also got other hostile armed forces that operate in the AO as well. What I loved over there, uh, people over there were fantastic. When you actually got out of your car and you got to talk to people, whether you were in uniform or whether it was on your days off, um, the people over there uh, are very quite warm and friendly, uh, especially to Australian uh, soldiers, but also to just uh, Australians in general. Uh, we have a lot of uh, Australians living in Lebanon and I think we have a lot of Lebanese living in places like Sydney so we already have that international relations. Our food there is fantastic but unfortunately the struggles with the lack of uh, electricity and gases okay so they rely on generators but if generators aren't working fridges aren't working. If fridges aren't working then safe food handling is a big risk factor so your potential milk, cheese, cheeses, meats and stuff like that are potentially not kept at the right temperature, what we are used to here in Australia. Uh, so you've got to pick and choose where you eat, but when you can pick and choose, some of the fresh food produce is fantastic. The fruit and veg is unbelievable. Um, if you can get out and meet the local population, um, there would be local farmers that would grow like olives, um, they would do tobacco farms and stuff like that and you would see the, the farmers, not only just men but women, working from 5am in the morning to like 5pm at night and just would not stop and they work for like a dollar US. Uh, dollars, which is which is ridiculous. You couldn't even think about doing that in Australia. But meeting those people firsthand, hearing their stories and talking to their kids, and just seeing that they've got a smile on their face because it's the little things that they they get uh, happy about and get excited about. When we used to drive through villages and would have the white UN, and when we'd go through, some kids would be like standing there waving. You give them like a honk and you'd smile, and you just see that kids would just naturally just have a massive smile on their face because these people have just stopped and waved and, and just little things like that. So they're the things that um, helped me sort of live over there for the eight months um, because unfortunately being over there for eight months you're away from your family. Um, I don't have any children at the moment but I do have a dog and a cat. Um, like just being on the phone talking to my mum, my brothers and my sisters, just little things like that you kind of miss out. But when you're over there, you sort of gain a second family and that's the local population and sort of the people that you work with as well, which is really great. So with the UN, with the ADF, um, deployments are selected and they're quite competitive. Uh, so there's very few and far between. I was lucky enough to put my name forward through my career advisor and I was selected as one of the senior captains uh, to deploy and represent ADF. We do try and represent um, a balance of males and females, but also combat calls and logistic calls. So we have that diversity over there. Um, since coming back, um, I've been posted back down to Albury Wodonga because I spent the last five years up in Darwin. So that was a culture shock in itself, going from Darwin to Lebanon and then all the way down to Albury Wodonga. Uh, but what makes it really great is that I have a wife that is a serving uh, spouse who is a captain in transport as well and she's posted uh, to the, uh, the uh, School of Logistics down at Albury Wodonga. And Defence is really good at recognising uh, same um, service uh, relationships and they try and post us together. And at the end of this year, we've both got a new posting order and we're off back up to Darwin, so which will be a little bit warmer. <laughs> Yeah, so um, defence, I find they're like a sporting team, I guess. If you, you think about when you're 15 years old and you, if you played rugby or any, any type of sport, you just feel what that teamship, sort of that mateship is. Now put that 
but enhance it by about 200%, and that's what you get in the defence. You're part of a family. We're not related, um, but we call other people defence uh, as part of our family. Uh, so when you're overseas on a deployment, it's even heightened again, because at, when we were in Lebanon, there was five of us. So there was 14 people spread out between Israel, Lebanon and Syria, okay? But there was five of us living in Lebanon. So we were going through 18 hours of blackouts. Uh, we were going through different ups and downs with the economy that we couldn't exchange money, we couldn't pay for certain things, we had hardship, but then we had really good times. But everything was enhanced. So you take all of that, and as a current serving member, um, I guess it's positive and not positive um, around Anzac Time and Remembrance. We see the whole nation come together for Anzac Day, which is fantastic. Um, it's great to see that we, we do give the public holiday so people do get up to attend dawn service and they take that moment to reflect on um, previous uh, veterans that they know of. Um, to take that moment and just remember what they've done or potentially just have an ear to, to listen to their story. The one thing that we have identified and what we are getting better at, and that's not only just defence people, but that's civilians as well, is being there for our veterans. Um, because we go from that really intense um, sort of 400% sort of environment where we've got somebody next to us 24 seven, and we're in a, a, another country dealing with good, bad and ugly situations. And then we come back to Australia where it's a different tempo. We don't have our buddy next to us. So it's a different, it, it's a different pace. It's a different style, but we just need to be able to reach out and make sure that there's support agencies. Um, so one good thing that I think Australia in in general, not only in defence, is that we do have a lot of external agencies that provide extra support. So back in, I guess, 60s, 70s, when people came back from different wars, there wasn't um, those services there. If you suffered from mental health, you weren't encouraged to come back and talk about that. You had a stigma of, you're sick, you're injured, you're out where now it's, it's okay to talk about things. So whether it's good things, whether it's bad things, there are experiences that people need to actually share their story. And I think one thing as a nation that we need to do is make sure that we're there to listen and then provide any support that we can do. So I guess uh, to address the elephant in the room, um, so retention is a big thing at the moment. Um, so it's not only about women uh, numbers against the males, okay, because defence has been heavily male operated. Um, we go back to World War II, women were brought in to do sort of the clerk job, the nursing jobs, where now you will see women actually in combat positions. But it's, it's not about women and men, it's about having the numbers at the table, having the right person doing the right job at the right time. So I'm a logistic transport officer and my current role now, would it make any difference if I was a male? No. Does it make any difference that I'm a female? No. But what we want to do and what the ADF is trying to do is that we're trying to grow that diversity piece because if we have young, old, male, female, people that have come straight out of school, people like myself that joined when I was 30, or potentially people joining when they're 40. Uh, the reservist is a perfect example. So we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have psychologists, we have plumbers, we've got vehicle mechanics that have other professional jobs every other day of the week, but then they do ADF as a reserve. So ADF will just provide um, sort of that diversity and equity. Is it something that is potentially changing for the better? It's just something we need to be aware. As we grow as a nation, and as we move forward in the current sort of generation, we need to adapt and change. And it doesn't mean that, hey, we're gonna make 50% of females tomorrow. It's just about having the right person doing the right job and having the opportunities to be able to represent the best people forward. And that's the job at their hand. What I currently do now, uh, so I work 
behind the desk a little bit more. Uh, I do the analyse and design, which is uh, to a lot of people, um, it's a bit more of a, a slower moving sort of uh, pace job, very strategic level, and we implement tra uh, change at the training level. So we work on LMPs of the analyse and design, and then the schools or the training establishments will grab them, and then they are responsible for the development and the implementation uh, of doing that training. So we look after the SOLOC, which is a suite of logistic officer courses. Everybody has a different pathway and a different story. Um, we ask ourselves, if I had my time again, would I have joined military a little bit sooner? Part of me, 50% of me says yes, because I've, I've missed that opportunity to come straight out of school and meet the mateship that I have now um, and the, the, the skills, the knowledge, uh, the education, uh, just, just life in general that the Army provides and the opportunities to travel, um, not only around Australia, but internationally as well. So those little things, I'm a little bit jealous that I've started so long uh, but on the other hand, it's also, I had a, a little bit of a life beforehand, so I've now been able to bring uh, life experiences and my own little part of external into uh, defence. That's what makes ADF so unique, is that there's no one size fits everyone. We bring people in from 17 years old, Okay, whether you want to go OR or whether you want to go officer, whether you want to come in at 53 years old, there's a, there's a uh, position and a role for everybody. Um, would I change, change it again? Um, I don't think I will, um, but I, the one thing that I would recommend is that I would definitely, as part of my life, one of my careers is definitely the ADF. Now, I've done 10 years to date. Um, where do I see myself in the future? I see myself retiring from the ADF. Uh, this is sort of my second slash third career, uh, but this is my career now because this is where I can make a difference. This is where I'm quite happy, but this is also that job satisfaction that I can keep pushing and pushing and sort of keep growing as an individual and not sort of get too bored and get plateaued. So.